Hi, welcome to today's episode of the Impact Podcast, where we talk to the leaders of today to find out how they got to where they are and how we may follow in their footsteps. Today's guest is a distinguished figure in the field of social service, Ms. Anita Pham. Roles in her illustrious portfolio include President of the National Council of Social Services, Chair of the Third Enabling Singapore Master Plan Steering Committee, and Justice of the Peace. And she has received various accolades, such as the Public Service Medal and Public Service Star. With that, let us welcome Ms. Pham to the podcast. Hi, Good afternoon, Ms. Pham. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking the time out to meet us. How has your day been today? It's been good. It was a very exciting morning of driving my son to the dentist <laughs> before he goes off to college. So I see, I see. It's, it's been a fairly quiet day. My, my meetings every day differ. No day is the same uh, as, as it used to be when I was in the office. Oh, I see. In, in what way? Well, you know, my, in my previous life, I was a lawyer. So I practiced in a law firm for many years. My last day of paid work was 31st of December, 1999, which is probably way before some of you were born. Uh, some of you might've been born then and you might've been in your diapers, uh, but uh, I was a practicing lawyer and I stopped work completely actually uh, to look after my daughter who was just about to turn a year old then. So in those days, if you can imagine, I had, um, well, what you call regular office hours, but you know, what is regular? It's not nine to five, it's not nine to six. It was 7.30 in the morning. And a lot of times I finished uh, one o'clock at night. Sometimes they're all nighters. Uh, a lot of times it's four o'clock in the morning. I considered it would be a good day if I managed to get home by 9.30 in the evening. And uh, my work entailed me, uh, it sounds very glamorous, but it wasn't. I mean, I would fly to Jakarta for the day to negotiate. So I'd be on the first plane out and I'd be on the last plane back. I it was see. very tiring, it was exciting, but I mean, it, I've left that life behind me. And what I'm doing now is way more fulfilling personally. I see, I see. So I think in your previous interviews, you sort of mentioned that you fell into the world of social service. Would you mind sharing how your transition was from this jet-setting legal lifestyle to um, something a bit more, I, I would say, a bit less glamorous, but something a lot more meaningful in that yeah, sense? I mean, it was totally, totally unplanned. It really was. So, I mean, you know, it's not like I said, okay, for the first 10, 15 years of my life, I would do this and then, you know, I would do something else. And it's funny because when I got into this, actually, I got into it a little bit earlier. In 1994, I, um, I was approached uh, by one of my mom's friends. This is Mrs. Liana Tambaya. And she said, my, my brother has passed away. He was the legal advisor to the charity I'm involved in, and it's AWWA, AWWA which stands for Asian Women's Welfare Association. I see. Okay. And she said, you know, uh, we need a lawyer to do pro bono legal work. Can you help us? Can you join our board? So in 1994, I just made junior partner in the law firm. So I had a little more latitude over my personal life and timing. And their board meetings were held during office hours uh, once a month. So I said, yes, I'm available. So I actually joined their board in 1994 and I served there until 1997. Uh, when I changed jobs, I left legal practice and I went in-house into a U.S. Uh, multinational company called Enron, which is went down the toilet in, <laughs> in flames, in bankruptcy flames. But I, I uh, was working there for a number of years and I was flying around even more by then. So it wasn't practical for me to be on the board and I passed it on to someone else. But when I stopped work in, at the end of um, 1999, Mrs. Timbaugh heard that I was by then a full-time mom and she rang me up and she said, um, can you join? Um, you know, I chair this integration panel in AWA. Can you be the vice chair? And I very naively said, yes. Why naively? Well, I agreed to be vice chair. And one year later at the AGM, I discovered when I walked into the AGM room that there was my name on the board to be chair of that particular service. Oh no. And, and so I got plunged into it uh, without realizing what I was in for. But the thing is, the other thing that was really um, surprising to me was about a few years later, at a meeting, I get this long-term service award for being a volunteer. And I'm thinking to myself, why am I getting this? Because I'm not a volunteer. 
Because in my mind, a volunteer in the social service sector is someone who befriends, uh, might be you know, in, the, in a daycare center, uh, really assisting the old folks, bringing them for medical appointments, playing mahjong with them, and giving tuition to kids. Very, very hands-on, direct-facing volunteering. And there I was getting this <laughs> Volunteers Award. And then it was a light bulb moment that what I was doing, what was I doing? I was sitting in an aircon room around in a boardroom, sitting on committees, doing stuff that I was familiar with, which was really governance, um, drafting uh, resolutions, um, giving advice uh, for the organization, legal advice. And I didn't realize that was volunteering. So and so it's actually using your own personal experiences in how you volunteer. So in that way, um, I think you've just mentioned that your role is remarkably similar to what you were doing as, as a legal consultant. Would you say that there were any challenges in adapting to this field of social service specifically, as opposed to you know, international finance? Actually, for me, the role that I had the greatest difficulty adjusting to was being a full-time mom. So it was from being really, really busy in the office to being really, really busy at home. And I, I used to measure uh, how good a day was as to whether I could read the newspaper, oh. whether I could you know, go to the toilet uh, in peace, because by that time, not only did I have my daughter, uh, uh, my son came along, they're, they're only 18 months apart. So it was pretty intense having two little ones. And I was their full-time mom. So for me, the first, it took me about a year after I stopped work. So the first year when my daughter was born, I still worked and I worked part-time. And I really felt, I had a wonderful arrangement where I only had to work mornings and of which only two were in the office, the rest were at home. But I felt as if I was shortchanging everyone. I felt as if I was shortchanging the workplace, I was shortchanging the home in the sense that I couldn't give 100% to both. So it was a personal decision on my part and in consultation with my husband and also with my family, the comfort level of me stopping work completely and, and really devoting myself to, to family and home. It took me about a year. And in fact, I felt quite sorry for myself because I realized that when you are in the workplace, that is your time. You, uh, and it's me time. Whereas at mm. home, it's just a very, very different consideration. And so it wasn't so much as me adjusting to the social service sector. And in fact, the irony is, is that as the years went on and I got more involved in the social service sector, that became my me time. That was, I mean, in the beginning, the commitment wasn't so great. It might've been two hours for a board meeting or committee meeting once a month. And so when the kids were tiny, that made a whole lot of sense. It gave me a little bit of relief and it was different from the usual routine of changing nappies and feeding them and, and bringing them to the park. But, uh, and there I could use my mind. As, mm. as you, had, you had mentioned earlier, you know, it's using the skills uh, that I had before. So the, the transition in that respect wasn't so great. It wasn't. And as the kids grew older, and when they went to school, I had more time to spend in this sector. And see, so actually now I'm pretty much full time in this, this sector. Mm, okay. Um, I think in previous interviews, you've also mentioned that you did not have that much awareness of the challenges that people have faced in, in your youth. Would you say that there is like a structural difference between what we are learning now and, and back then? I don't think it's a structural thing. I, I think much of it was, was a me thing. I was absorbed, self-absorbed. I don't think I was mean and nasty, but I was wrapped up and bubbled up in my own comfortable little world. See, um, yeah. And so, especially when I went to uni, and I feel so embarrassed, you know, when I look back, and I only realized it's probably 20 years after I graduated, okay? So mm -hmm. I, um, for, cause for the first, let's say, you know, 10, 20 years, I was absorbed in, in my career and raising my family. So that was to a certain degree, um, self-absorption as well. And I tell you what happened. One day we, um, we had a, a law school reunion. I see. And one of my classmates shared this story because when he was in school, he in law school, he was one of those who had to hold 
two jobs. He had to, you know, give tuition because he didn't to to really pay for the school fees. And he confided in one of his closest friends. And his friend, good friend, went out and got him what he thought was a education bursary that uh. helped him so that he wouldn't have to hold these two jobs. Two decades later, he discovered that actually the bursary came from his friend's father. I see. His friend's father had actually financed that bursary for him. Wow. And with that, now he's this, you know, both of them are very successful lawyers and um, he's paid it forward. So when we, we had a scholarship fund that we created and he was the first one to really contribute to that scholarship fund. And that's when I had that moment of awakening that throughout law school, you know, I was one of those, I confess. Um, I barely went for classes. I mean, and in those days, they weren't really very strict about attendance. So, you know, I was one of those who went off to watch movies. I was by the beach. I was hanging out with friends. Mind you, I was also very involved in uni life. So I was president of law club. I was in NUSU. I mean, uh, all the fun stuff, you know? Yes. And I wasn't there for classes. So if I had to, I was bodily there, but mentally not, not quite there. <laughs> and totally oblivious to the plights of, and challenges of some of my classmates. Because then I discovered after that, there were quite a few of my classmates who were really holding several jobs so that they could be in law school. Whereas I, it was something I just took for granted. And you know, in those days, fees were far less than what you pay now. In yes. those days, we probably paid about $3,000 a year. Okay, so it was far less. So it, I mean, I look back and I wish that I had lived that part of my life differently. Mm. I feel embarrassed about it. Because it was really, as I said, it was a case of self-absorption. I can't blame it on the system. Um, though having said that, sometimes I think our systems insulate us. Uh, and so it's really being a little bit more aware of the folks around us and what they're going through and being sensitive to that. I see, I see. So um, I think we have a good idea of what you, your, your role to the world of social impact has been. But um, you have made quite a few... Uh, impacts on the world. So I think to start off, um, what do you think your most significant role or decision was in this field of social service? I think one of the things that I'm proudest of was um, the third and eighth meeting master plan, uh, which I chaired. Disability is something very, very close to my heart. And it, I think it's because I cut my teeth in AWA in the field of disability. I mentioned to you that that service that I... I ended up chairing was actually an integration service that integrated physically disabled um, kids uh, into mainstream schools. I see. It. So, um, you know, the, the Paralympians that you see now, so the Teresa Goes, the Yip Pin Sius, they all came from this program. Max oh. was taking part in this year's, uh, and Pin Siu, they're both in the Paralympics this year. They are both uh, from this program, it was called Teach Me. That was its name. It's changed its name now to a community integration program. So I'm very, very proud uh, of that legacy of integration work. But also because I cut my teeth in the disability sector, it's, it's a sector and an area that I really have a very, very deep passion for. And I was not involved in the first master plan, even though I was involved in the disability space by then. But mm. by the second master plan, these master plans last for five years each. And by the second master plan, I was asked to, to chair a subcommittee. And it was a subcommittee on employment, education, and healthy lifestyle. Okay. And, and from there, the, um, we, we made a, quite a lot of recommendations. But for the third master plan, they approached me and asked whether I would chair the whole thing. And I, I said yes, uh, almost instantly, because mm. I felt that if I could... Um, really contribute in some way, uh, knowing what some of the pain points were that I, I, it would be a deep honor and privilege to be involved in that. I and see. to see what has come out of it from the second and third master plan, you know, I'm just um, very proud that I had a small role to play in that. Mm, okay, okay. Um, I think onto the topic of the, the third enabling master plan, um, I would just like to ask you if you've heard of this uh, free Britney movement that has been gaining traction on social media where um, celebrity Britney Spears actually is challenging her conservatorship. So I guess 
in that vein, uh, there's this idea of, you know, the autonomy of those who are under the care of others. So what do you think is the next step forward in having the disabled play an active role in their own care? Absolutely. Dignity is what it's all about. And it's giving people that, that sense of dignity by helping them and allowing them to make choices for themselves. So in fact, one of the major shifts that we're trying to do even in the social service sector is to shift from a program-centered approach. Because at the moment, and this is, this is historical, we've always funded programs to fix a specific need of a person, but we're shifting it to being person-centered. And underscoring that when you think of person-centered, it means in the center of it all is the person. And it's not deciding for that person what you think that person should have or shouldn't have. It's mm -hmm. really allowing that person is as much as they can possibly do so. Because you, know, you have to acknowledge that in this realm of disability, we have people with deferring needs from those who are cognitively very, very able to make decisions for themselves. I mean, they go to university, they're very successful. And then, but we have those who cognitively may not be so able, but mm -hmm. even at their level, we may be able to allow them to exercise a choice. The simplest thing might be even allowing them to choose what they want to eat. You give them two things and ask them to decide for themselves which item, as opposed to saying, you have no choice. I'm just going to give you this, whether you like it or not. So underscoring the whole thing is enabling someone to be able to exercise choice as much as they are able to do. So this, um, so I would say that that's the shift in, in um, it. So this would apply not only in the realm of disability, but also the other thing that's really, you know, um, the topic of the day is really mental health. So even in that situation is recognizing that no matter what state we are in, we still have the ability to exercise choice. And because un underscoring all that is recognizing the dignity of an individual. I think this is a very interesting concept, like the idea of autonomy and, and dignity. And, and, I, and I realized from what you said just now that this is really an, an entire broad spectrum mindset change as opposed to some things like, you know, uh, uh, like the creation of boards and, and policies. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting direction where, where aid is going. And I think uh, onto the topic of mental health, I, I do understand that, that the NCSS has started this peer support scheme uh, and it has been active, I think for a few years now. So I'd just like to ask you, you know, how, how has this scheme benefited the participants? And do you see any avenues for expansion or, or improvement in this, in this area? Yeah. Okay, let me tell you about that. It started, we made a trip to, to uh, New York and Phoenix in 2014 because we had heard that, you know, around the world, the peer movement in this space is, is strong. So we went there to understand what peer support uh, meant. And what it is, is really equipping people with lived experiences. So these are people who have had the experience of mental health challenges some of them severely ill, they might have been hospitalized to be, uh, you know, really get sorted out uh, with, with treatment and then they come out and they recover, but they've had this experience. And with that experience, they can advocate for others so that others in the workplace can actually understand what they've been through. And I'll tell you this amazing story. We, one of the first meetings we had in New York was we had to go to this penitentiary and they had this meeting inside the pen penitentiary was this guy and he was, con he was coordinating a meeting for the entire state of New York. And he was doing wow. it, big, he, so he was at a big board table. So there were probably about 20 folks around the table, but he also had TV screens because people from all over the state beamed in so that they could give their update because he was coordinating all the, the care, the mental health care in, in that state. And so, you know, we were flies on the wall listening to this and, and taking notes. And then after that, we had the opportunity to meet him for lunch. And then I discovered he was a person in recovery. And he told us that even as he was talking to us, he could hear several voices in his head. Uh, okay. okay. So even though he had recovered enough to hold this very, very important job, he still heard voices. So I asked him, I said, how do you know which voice to listen to? And he says, I look for the ones whose lips are moving. 
<laughs> oh, that's the one to listen to. But that, you see, and then I met another person there and she was doing the legislation for the state and she had had a long history of mental illness. Yet she was a very, very important policymaker. But both of them were using their own lived experiences. So with that, they had the expertise to be able to advocate and also manage and speak up and look out for others because of that lived experience. So we came back to Singapore realizing the power of lived experience. And so we've actually finished our sixth round of training for peer support specialists. There's been, oh, I think 113 graduates so far because we went in 2014, right? So we came back 2015, we started this about 2016. And we've had these batches who have come in and we've trained them. And we, with these graduates, we've embedded them in various social service agencies and, and health institutions so that they are there to be advocates to really, um, help those who come in with this sort of, you know, they, if they help people who come into the workplace who are recovering, mm. but also to be an advocate for the HR people in the workplace as well as their colleagues to, so that they will understand the challenges that what a person in recovery will have when they come into the workplace. It's a very, very powerful scheme. And my dream is that more and more of our companies will accept peer support specialists in their midst. So we've actually got a scheme now uh, where we actually fund um, the employment of these peer support specialists in a company for 24 months. It's to encourage employment and then with that is with the, with the hope that they from then on they will actually pay for the the PSSs to stay in their companies recognizing their worth and their value. See, so yeah we really believe in this and so far it's been working out really well. I think with this uh, like the, the zeitgeist of mental health in Singapore is, I think mindsets are beginning to shift, but um, I do realise that, I guess, in, in positions of leadership, you know, it still might be a bit stigmatised. So do you think uh, we are sort of ready for, you know, uh, I guess people in higher positions of power or influence uh, uh, sharing their experiences as, as well? Actually, if you notice, there have been some people who have started doing it. Have you, uh, Piyush? Piyush, uh, the CEO of DBS, actually had a piece that he shared about his own experience. And so has CFUA. CFUA was, my, was the president before me in NCSS. And these two gentlemen are very, very prominent. And I very intentionally shared um, my own personal story about my, my father. My late father was very involved uh, in public service. Um, he was chairman of HDB, uh, MRT, um, and, and various other things. And, mm. and, but he had a long history of clinical depression. The first time it happened when I was doing my A-levels. Scared the daylights out of me. Uh, I was sworn to not to tell anyone. I thought I was going to explode with the knowledge because I couldn't tell anyone. Mm. And it was very frightening when you have someone whom you really admire sit by your bedside weeping. And, and I just didn't know what to do. He confided in me, I couldn't confide in anyone else. And that was, I mean, I was 18. So that's nine, a long time ago, okay, 1981. So in those days, it was absolutely taboo to speak about these things. When he turned eight, then after that he recovered and then he continued and that's why he ended up doing all these things. And he was um, very, very, prominent in public service until he retired at 19 in when at the age of 81 and I steeled myself because he was plunged into deep depression at the age of 55 because that was the retirement age in those days mm. and then when he retired again at 81 I thought mm, I'm going to brace myself and sure enough it happened but by that time thankfully he could recognize his own symptoms so he went to see a doctor uh, after that but I made it a point and this was after he had passed away though to share with people about his experience in, to, 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 in the hope that people will recognize that, you know, this sort of thing happens to anyone. It can happen to anyone. It could be the most prominent person in Singapore or the least prominent. It does not discriminate. Mental health does not discriminate. We may all experience it at some stage in our lives. And it's a question of being able to talk about it more openly and being ready and open to seek help as much as we can. Because I can tell you this, seeking help really makes all the difference. And one thing I would like to add though, is that when you seek help, 
that relief doesn't come instantly. And I've always told people that because a lot of times it's a chemical imbalance. A lot of times it might have been something that, you know, happened when you were growing up, and which has really hurt you so deeply that you've buried away because you don't want to deal with it. So sometimes if it's a chemical imbalance, you need the medication to just right that chemical imbalance, but it takes weeks and months. And I always say that one day it's like turning on the light. You, you feel lousy. And then all of a sudden it writes itself. And one day you feel as if someone's turned on the lights for you. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, if you have all these deep seated hurts and experiences that you've buried away in you, sometimes you need a counselor to help you journey through all those very, very painful moments to really help you work through them and exorcise them from your system. And then that will take months and years. So I always tell everyone that mental health conditions are illnesses. Mental health challenges are real conditions. And the most important thing is we need to seek help. Sometimes we've got to find the right fit. You may hate the counselor that you see. It's looking for the right fit and also mm. be really patient. And if possible, having people around you, even just one person that you can confide in, I think it helps tremendously. I think being that person also does have its own stresses, right? Um, I think you've talked a, a bit about how you, uh, you, you, you found a lot of difficulty adapting to being, I guess, a caregiver or being, you know, a full-time mother. So, um, you know, beyond current efforts at, at, how, at our support for caregivers, what do you think we as a society should do to aid them in that sense? Um, you mentioned stigma. I think um, that has a lot to do with it because um, we're afraid to share what we're going through for fear of what people think. You may have a sibling who is going through um, a, a very challenging time with a mental health condition, but you don't tell anyone about it for fear of what people think. You might be going through something yourself and you don't let your, you know, you won't want your, your college administration to know for fear the repercussions. A lot of it is stigma. But the other challenge is knowing where to find the help. And to me, that is one of the things that we're trying to fix is actually providing clearer pathways of help. Also, clearer pathways of affordable help. Because there are many things. So for instance, even um, um, amongst tertiary students, the fear is going seeking help in your own tertiary institution uh, because you don't want them to know about it for fear of repercussion. Then. What's the other alternative? The alternative might be outside the IHL, but can you afford the treatment? And then also, one thing is affordability. The other thing is just seeing where you can even find the help. I mean, I must say that in the last few years, there have been more movements, more awareness in this space, but still it's a pretty difficult space to navigate. And from time to time, you know, I get people asking me where to seek help and it's not, and, and I'm in this space, right? Yet, I can't give a clear answer straight off the bat. I have to do a little bit of research, find out what, what that person's background is to, and for me to find out what would be a good fit in terms of potential help that's available. So those are the three things. It's stigma, so it's mindset, right? Even seeking help in the first instance and sharing about it even with friends. Secondly, it's access, pathways. And then the third is affordability. Because the last thing you, and I've had this experience where, you know, I've had some young people say, I, I, I can't afford it. I can't tell my parents. I don't want my parents to know that I'm seeking help. The other thing is parents themselves are a roadblock because they may not want to admit that their child needs help. And that's hard because a lot of times I must say amongst our young generation now, there is a far greater awareness of needing help. Yes. And that's different from my time. But Knowing that you need help and seeking it and, and is another thing because you're so afraid that your parents will know. The other thing is you're so afraid that your parents will not understand. And many times parents don't understand. So how do we navigate through that? So those are the things which I, you know, we think about much of the time. I think uh, on that topic of affordability, I think you have mentioned how the, the next challenge for aid in Singapore is the sandwich class or, or the lower middle, the, the, the lower middle class, right? And I feel like a lot of, a lot of medical procedures, like, I, like personally, because uh, of what I've, 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 like the work that I've done in the past, I realized that there are lots of beneficial medical procedures that are 
uncovered, they're not covered rather by, by insurance schemes and the government. So what do you think we can do to sort of address this, this gap? You know, I can understand. I mean, having, you know, been in the sector for two, more than two decades now and seeing the introduction of, of means testing, or as you know, in the past, I've called it mean testing. To be honest, it's slightly less mean nowadays than it was 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you had to be the poorest of the poor to access. And I've always said that if you are really in the lowest income group, even now, there's so much help, really enormous amount of help. But the challenge is getting appropriate help and support for those uh, who don't on the face of it qualify for any sort of subvention. Uh, and those would be the sandwich class, a lower middle income group, and we will have very little liquidity. I think now there are a few more pathways open because I think there's a growing awareness that you know in Singapore now, um, being poor has a very different meaning. Mm. Being poor doesn't mean just income wise. Being poor can be in terms of an you know, emotional poorness when we're very lonely and isolated. It can be uh, being poor because um, we just can't have access to certain services. Uh, being poor because the challenges that we have do not discriminate um, where income is concerned. Uh, dementia is a very good example. If you're a caregiver of a person with dementia, you could be living in our largest house in Singapore, or the smallest one, but the challenges are not far off, different from each other. Uh, same if you have a child with disabilities, especially if they are neurological differences. You know, see, yes. with autism, who on the face of it, physically look no different from everyone else, but they behave differently and people don't understand it. So I think there is a more greater awareness now. And even though it's not ideal, I think there are now certain, um, there are certain exceptions being made. Uh, so even in these schemes, which are very, very regulated, we have these things called, you know, it's a 10% deviation, where in that you have a certain amount of discretion to allow for a person to access subsidies or subvention. But back to things like elective surgery, you know, it's a question of, is it nice to have or need to have? I think we're still at that stage because of the limited resources that we have. And I, and I see that every day because um, the needs of our community are growing uh, with the complexities that we have. So even when I started in this sector 20 years ago, the needs were far more hand to mouth, you know, bread and butter issues. But now, you know, we have become a far more sophisticated uh, country and community. Those aren't the things that we're really so worried about. It's more than that. So we're, you know, we're looking at quality of life. It's not life and death anymore. It's quality of life that we're looking at. And, and so our policies are, are slowly titrating uh, and being different. But I think, you know, like last year's um, when COVID hit, I think it surfaced quite a few things that we have still need, we still need quite a lot of work to do. Definitely. And of course, one was the migrant workers plight. And I'm so honestly, it is a blessing in disguise that what took place last year heightened that there's this huge blind spot that we had in our country to a big segment of people who are integral to our country. And at least now, to a certain degree, they're getting more help than they had before. It's not ideal, but it's a start. What else was heightened? Mental, the mental health and, mm -hmm. and the, the isolation uh, that everyone experienced last year and the challenges that that have presented themselves with. So I, you know, to me, COVID has been a silver lining in that sense, because it's really spotlighted. And also the, you talked about caregivers, that's the thing, the other challenge that has been highlighted. So it's mental health conditions, it's caregivers, it's access to services in the light of not being able to have physical access. And so in a way, I, I mean, part of me wishes that COVID never happened, but a little part of me is glad that it has because it has compelled some change um, to our society and our community. I think right now we've talked at length about you know, contemporary issues in the social sector. 
But how do you think we as young people can go about taking, uh, making a career for ourselves in, in, in this field? I would say the two things. One is to explore by volunteering. Uh, even when you're in uni, um, volunteer and see whether you like it. And if you like that space, then I would say explore it. There's so many more options now, if you think about it. One place is, uh, you know, we've called it the, in NCSS, we call it the social service tribe. And this is the community that we have created for people to, to learn more about what people in the social service sector do. So I think if you know, if you just Google in um, social service tribe, uh, you will get all the information there. And there are different opportunities uh, employment opportunities to be in this space. So there could be, you know, for instance, uh, of course, the obvious ones are if you're, in, if you're doing a social work degree or, you know, a psychology degree, there's counseling, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that you can do. Uh, volunteer managers, being executives in the social service sector, just working administrative roles, um, even in the teaching line. Um, and especially now, I don't know, today's parliament sitting with, with uh, Minister Chan Chun Singh, they said they're actually going to try and build up that, that base of counselling and access points and have more uh, counsellors in that mid. So again, you know, it, this sector, and, and I, when I say sector now, it's not so much a social service sector, it's a whole ecosystem, a community, whether it's health, social service, education. Um, they're all doing very, very meaningful things. So I would say first thing is try volunteering. And see whether that resonates. If it does resonate, then you might think, okay, you know, that, then this, this sector might be a good fit. And in this sector, there are so many opportunities. I mean, hey, we need accountants. We need business grads. We need, so it's actually, it's not limiting. It's anyone with a passion and an interest, uh, those opportunities are boundless. I see. So it's more about finding what we are good in and yeah. applying that to the social service sector. And I would say that's how we should do volunteering. So unlike me, where I thought the traditional mode of volunteering was, you know, singing karaoke with an with a, you know, uh, a check in the <laughs> uh, day activity center. Then I realized, okay, um, for me, it was really applying my legal skills and background. Uh, to what I'm doing now, my organizational skills. And, and for folks who are studying now, as I said, it could be, um, I, oh, I tell you what we really need. I mean, IT skills. And, and um, you know, we're quite a lot of us in the sectors, you know, especially the older ones are still dinosaurs, okay, where social media is concerned. So it's really even coming into the sector, um, using one skill, okay, TikTok. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, make short, TikTok um, snip, snippets. That's one way of volunteering. If you think about it, it's approaching a social service agency and saying, hey, let me make you some TikTok videos so that you can put it on your Facebook so you can reach out to more people. That is a good example of volunteering that won't take someone out of their comfort zone. It's something that, you know, one, some, some, some of our young people are really good at that. So, I see, I see. So, um... I think we're, we're going to have to wrap this up now. But what are the three most important takeaways from this interview that you want our listeners to, to have? Okay, I have three things. One is be aware. Be aware of those around you. Be sensitive to what's happening around you. Whether it's in your school, uh, in your family, in your community, be aware, be sensitive to that. And the next thing is to be proactive. Because if you are aware that something's not quite right or something needs to be fixed or you think, you think something can be done better, be proactive, step forward, offer, offer to do it. Doesn't matter whether people think you're nuts or not. Don't, don't, don't think of what people think. But if you think it's going to help someone, just do it, be proactive. And the fi final thing is, and I, I would say, do your best. Do your best in whatever you do. You may hate it, you may love it. Give of your best. And I wish that I had done these three more, especially when I was your age. That's one of the biggest regrets I've had. I see, I see. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Pham. With that, we have come to the end of this episode of the Impact Podcast. We hope that you guys have gained some insight 
into what it means to work in the field of social service and maybe a bit of what impact you, you can have. So uh, once again, thank you so much, Ms. Fan, for, for taking out your time to speak to us. And with that, uh, thank you and <laughs> goodbye. A pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ms. Fan. Bye-bye. Thank you.